Our scripture reading today is from Luke 19, verses 28 through 44. After Jesus said them, he continued on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As Jesus came to Bethphage in Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he gave his two disciples a task. He said, go into, Nidla, go into the village over there. When you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. If anyone asks, why are you untying it? Just say, my its master needs it. Those who had been sent found it exactly as he had said. As they were untying the colt, you know, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, its master needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their clothes on the colt, and lifted Jesus onto it. As Jesus rode along, they spread their clothes on the road. As Jesus approached the road leading down from the Mount of Olives, the whole throng of his disciples began rejoicing. They praised God with a loud voice because of all of the mighty things they had seen. They said, Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, scold your disciples, tell them to stop. He answered, I tell you, if they were silent, the stones would shout. As Jesus came to the sea and observed it, he wept a little. He said, Only you knew I miss of all days, the things that lead to peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. The time will come when your enemies will build fortifications around you and circle you and attack you from all sides. They will crush you completely, you and the people within you. They won't leave one stone on top of another within you because you didn't need, because you didn't recognize the time of your gracious visit from God. Our sermon hymn is Hosanna, how long Hosanna, page 278 in the hymn. Holy Week, 
most likely in the home of Jesus' friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Picture this. Jesus wakes up early in the morning. The sun is out, the birds are singing, dogs are barking, and children are laughing. Excitement is in the air. Jerusalem and the surrounding towns are bursting at the seams with people who have come a long way to participate in Israel's most important celebration, the Passover. It's Palm Sunday, and Jesus is happy. This day will be his coming out party. After a lifetime of preparation and prayer, three years of traveling and teaching, this is the day and the place where Jesus will present himself to the world as the Messiah. Did I say Jesus is happy? Yes, it is true. He knows where he has come from. He knows all he has done to proclaim the kingdom of God. He knows he has been faithful in his ministry and mission. And he knows that the end of his earthly ministry is near. But he also knows that before he reaches the end, there's going to be a lot of pain in between. Nevertheless, his eyes are fixed on God, and there's a song in his heart. Really? How can he possibly look toward Friday and be smiling? Because his eyes don't stop there. They look beyond the pain. Jesus is focusing on Easter Sunday, on the 40 days from then until his ascension, and on going home to sit on the throne of heaven next to his Father, knowing that what he accomplished on earth will enable all who choose to believe in him to spend eternity with God. The time for traveling and performing miracles is over. Jesus sets his eyes on Jerusalem, and he never looks back. He and his disciples reach the Mount of Olives, and as we read from Luke, he sends two of them into the village to find a colt and bring it to him. Jesus didn't ask for a horse so he could ride into the city with his sword drawn, ready to conquer the Roman oppressors. He didn't come boldly with huge fanfare as a political revolutionary. No, he chose to come peacefully, humbly, on a lowly donkey, thus fulfilling the prophecy we read from Zechariah. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. There are several stories in scripture of Jesus healing people and then instructing them or the witnesses not to tell anyone what he had done. There is a story about Jesus disappearing in a crowd that was trying to seize him and make him king by force after he had performed a miracle. Now we understand why he wanted them to keep quiet. Jesus was waiting for this day. He chose this time and place to boldly and publicly claim his title. Jesus chose to ride into Jerusalem in a way that was unmistakably declared, that unmistakably declared him to be the Messiah. Here was a man with a price on his head, riding into the city in broad daylight, claiming to be the real king of Israel. This took glorious defiance, and superlative courage. The disciples threw their cloaks on the donkey and put Jesus on it. They began their descent into the city. His entrance on the donkey was not only fulfillment of prophecy, but an announcement that he was coming to usher in a kingdom of peace, a peace that the world can never know apart from Jesus Christ. Earlier we talked about Jesus being happy that this day had finally come. However, in verse 41 to 44, we read that Jesus wept 
as he looked over the city of Jerusalem. Although this day was about parades and smiles and victorious waving of palm branches, Jesus had a moment when he wept. In verse 41, the Greek translation of the word wept doesn't mean a quiet sniffle and a few tears. It translates heartbreaking sobbing, the kind often associated with funerals. Why does Jesus cry his heart out? Not for himself, but for the nation of Israel, for their missed opportunity. Jesus is Israel's last, best hope for personal and national salvation, yet he knows he will be rejected. He knows they will reject his gift of spiritual renewal. He knows there will be a military confrontation with Rome, a battle the Jewish people cannot win, and that 40 years later, the Roman army will completely devastate and destroy the city. Not one stone of Solomon's glorious temple will be left in place. As Jesus descends the Mount of Olives, the disciples begin shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Crowds begin to gather, watching and listening. It isn't long before they are shouting and cheering too. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They grab anything they can get their hands on. They tear palm branches from the trees. They tear the clothes off their backs and throw them in his path as a royal carpet fit for a king. Then they wave their palms and salute to their Messiah. Look out, Rome, you're in trouble now. Our deliverer is here. The people go wild when they see Jesus. They believe that their liberation is at hand. Seeing the reaction of the people, the Pharisees tell Jesus to rebuke his followers. Jesus responds, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Jesus is telling them that nothing can stop this movement. Even if he silenced the people, every inanimate object of creation would rise up and testify that he is the Messiah. This is the day that all of history has been preparing for, when Jesus is finally declared to be king. God had orchestrated this moment in time, and nothing man could do could stop it. The truth is that both the religious leaders and the people had the wrong idea about Jesus. The Jewish leaders refused to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Even when standing in the presence of God himself, they refused his offer of salvation in Jesus Christ. And because of that, the Jewish nation would suffer. The people rejoiced on Palm Sunday when they saw Jesus. They were enthusiastic, but also fickle. Were they really cheering for Jesus? Exactly whom did they see? Believers saw Jesus as the Messiah. However, many in the crowd who were yelling, Hosanna, hooray for Jesus, were really saying, down with Rome. With Jesus here, their enslavement is almost over. Freedom is so close, they can taste it. The crowd is at fever pitch, and they are ready to stand back and cheer him on when the battle begins. But it doesn't. Jesus rides to the plaza in front of the temple and dismounts. The crowd is tense with anticipation, watching his every move. Perhaps some are glancing toward heaven, looking for a sign of what is to come. This is the moment that has kept their faith alive for centuries. This is their hope and inspiration of their worship. Jesus enters the temple, and they wait, and then wait, 
and then wait. Imagine an uneasy restlessness coming over the crowd. What is Jesus doing? The Gospel of Mark says that he goes into the temple, looks around at everything, and then he leaves. He just turns around and walks out. He does absolutely nothing. The people are stunned. Perhaps no event in history has built up to a greater anti-climax than Palm Sunday. Then slowly, one by one, the crowd begins to melt away. All that is left is eerie silence and an empty feeling in their hearts. There's no more singing, shouting, hosannas, or waving of palms. What a tremendous letdown. Jesus had his moment, and he failed. Many of them felt betrayed. One by one, they leave, terribly disappointed in this Messiah. The people wanted a warrior, not a weakling. And this is the tragedy of Palm Sunday. This is when it goes from rejoicing to rejection. There are two different expectations here, and there is no way to fulfill them both. The hope of the people for deliverance from slavery and the mission of Jesus for deliverance from sin. These two were mutually exclusive. For Jesus to accept a king's crown from the people would defeat the purpose of the cross. And to continue on to the cross would take away the king that the people were crying for. If only they knew that by believing in Jesus, they would receive freedom from slavery to sin. Jesus knew he must disappoint them. He knew he must walk away, or they would try to crown him as their earthly king. The crowds begin to turn against him, and Jesus, walking away from them, begins the passion or the suffering of Christ. Why did the masses so quickly and radically turn against him? How did the shouts of Hosanna on Sunday transform into shouts of crucify him on Friday? In just five days, everything fell apart. Why did the cheering stop? One reason could be that Jesus began to talk more and more about commitment. People liked hearing stories and watching him perform miracles. His message was one of extending grace upon grace. They liked receiving a meal of bread and fish when they were hungry. They liked being served and having their needs met. But now Jesus was saying things like, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, then come and follow me. Ouch. You mean I actually have to do something? I have to sacrifice and I have to give up something? They believed that wealth meant you were blessed by God and now they were being asked to give it all away. Jesus was saying, the time for miracles is over. Now is the time for commitment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Really? Jesus was no longer simply offering grace. He was teaching obligation. When we have received God's grace, then we are obligated to extend that grace to others. Jesus is expecting commitment to this new way of life. Commitment means that after the shouts of Hosanna, we must walk to Golgotha and carry his cross of suffering. And along with commitment comes sacrifice. And the cheering began to fade away. Another reason the cheering stopped could be that Jesus dared to suggest that all people were worth loving. On Palm Sunday, Jesus went to the temple, drove out the money changers, and then he invited the lame, the poor, the sick, and the outcasts into the temple. He dared 
to bring into the church people who were considered those seedy street people. They offended the religious leaders and others worshiping in the temple. They did not accept Jesus' message that all people have access to God and that this is what the kingdom of God is going to be like. Perhaps some of you remember an old commercial that was shown during the Olympics many years ago. It shows a group of young Special Olympics athletes getting ready to run a race. The starting pistol fires and the boys and girls began to run, but only a few yards into the race, one of the boys falls. A girl nearby runs past him, but then she stops and turns around and helps him up. Then all the other runners turn around, they come beside them, they all lock arms and they run to the finish line together. These children, whom some label as challenged, didn't follow the world's concept of taking advantage of a competitor while he is down. They cared more for their fallen comrade than about winning the race. There was not one winner, they were all winners, and crossed the finish line together, arm in arm, while the audience rose to their feet in applause. Do any of you remember that commercial? I'm the only one. It was wonderful. These young athletes showed what the kingdom of God is like. They challenged the belief that first place is everything. They showed that everyone matters, particularly those who have fallen and are on the outside. Jesus opened the doors of the church to everyone, and that angered the people. And the cheering continued to fade away. Another reason the cheering stopped could be that Jesus began to talk more and more about the cross. In the beginning, he talked about the kingdom of God. The people liked that and may have believed that this kingdom would restore Israel to the glory days of King David. But now Jesus was using words like sacrifice and giving up your life. Jesus was telling the people how God wanted them to behave, and it was different than the way that their culture taught. It was backwards. It didn't make any sense. They found it difficult to believe that he really meant what he was saying. How could that be? Sometimes we say that to God. Yes, Lord, I heard you, but I didn't really think you meant it. I don't think I can live like that. And the cheering stopped. By Friday of Holy Week, the people had lost hope that Jesus was their Messiah. Their selfishness and self-serving attitudes blinded them to the fact that the answer they thought was standing right in front of them, but they couldn't see it because Jesus didn't fit their version of a conquering Messiah. If only they had listened to his message. If only they had believed him. If only they had held on just a little bit longer, they would have received the answer to their prayers. The biggest blessing for all of mankind was right around the corner just three days away. Jesus defeating sin and death. Jesus taking our punishment and in return giving us the gift of eternal life, freeing us from bondage. If they had waited just three more days, but they couldn't wait. With prodding from the religious leaders who wanted to incite the people, they began calling out for Barabbas to be released. Maybe he could lead their rebellion against Rome. They couldn't wait any longer. They wanted a hero, a champion for their cause. And so they abandoned Jesus and turned to Barabbas. How often are we guilty of the same type of behavior? How often do we show the same impatience as the crowds who faced Jesus? Sometimes when we take our request to God, we already know what we want, and when we want it, and how we want God to answer our prayers, and we tell Him so. We think we know the answer, 
And it can become so ingrained in our mind that when we don't get the answer or the results that we want, we become disappointed and confused. We begin to question God, wondering, do you hear me? Why aren't you answering my prayer? Impatiently, we wait and become more unsure, more disillusioned and angry that God has turned his back on us. We can be like the people in the crowd who cry, crucify him. Instead of practicing patience in our prayer lives, we get impatient when our prayers aren't answered in the way that we want. We do get confused, frustrated, and perhaps angry with God. Our faith begins to weaken. Our hope starts to fade. And then we question whether God really cares about us at all. Some turn their backs on God, and that's how we go from rejoicing to rejection. We need to remember, however, that Palm Sunday wasn't just a path to the cross. Palm Sunday was a triumph, and here's why. It marked the triumph of love over hate. Mankind was expecting war, but what it got was sacrifice. Palm Sunday was a triumph because God decided to ignore our miserable state and instead, he came to us and welcomed us home. We don't deserve to be there, but he welcomes us just the same. God, in his grace, came down to us in the person of Jesus. He is in the midst of us all. And because of his presence with us, love will always triumph over hate, and life will always triumph over death. Maybe Jesus was singing as he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He could see what lay ahead, not just the cross, but way beyond the cross to the resurrection and his ascension to the Father, and then to Pentecost, when the church would be empowered to carry out his ministry, and to today, in 2024, as we are gathered here in this church to praise his name, and then all the way to the end of time, when all the saints of God will be gathered around the throne to sing God's praise forever. Hosanna, glory in the highest, blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen.